Now we're going to talk about the concept of a Fermi surface. Uh, the ground state of capital N block electrons is constructed in a similar fashion to that of free electrons, i.e. by occupying all one electron energy levels with band energies E sub n k less than E f, where E f is determined by requiring the total number of levels with energies less than the Fermi level to be equal to capital N over 2. So we're going to start filling these uh, states and for each uh, quantum state, each k value, allowed k value, we can put two electrons because we can have spin up or spin down. So when the total number of electrons is capital N, uh, we're, we're supposed to occupy capital N over 2 uh, levels. So when those levels are filled, we reach the maximum uh, filled level, which is our Fermi level. So um, in this, in doing so, we can find that a number of bands uh, may be filled, while others are empty, or a number of bands may be partially filled. So if the, if the band is partially filled, then we look at the energy of the highest occupied level and we call that the Fermi level. And for each uh, partially filled band, there will be a surface in the case space separating occupied levels from the empty levels. The set of all such surfaces is known as the Fermi surface and it's a generalization to black electrons of the free electron Fermi sphere. So if you remember, uh, in the case space, when we look at the, um, the occupied levels by free electrons, uh, we consider a Fermi sphere, so the maximum uh, value of the energy is basically the Fermi energy, that is the uh, maximum energy the electrons can have in occupying these states in the ground state. Now, uh, analytically, the branch of the Fermi surface in the nth band is a surface in K space where the energy is equal to the Fermi energy, that's a constant energy surface. So uh, let's look at the procedure for building a Fermi surface. So for example, we're looking at the two-dimensional square lattice in reciprocal space. Uh, so this is uh, in Kx and Ky directions. Uh, and basically, I have drawn the first uh, three reciprocal lattice vectors, g1, g2, and g3. If you remember, finding the brilliant zones in the reciprocal lattice is basically finding the wigner zeitz primitive cells. So we look at the perpendicular bisector of g1. So uh, since these are uh, changing in units of 2 pi over a, we find that the first brilliant zone is going to be the area enclosed by perpendicular bisectors of g1 vector, which is plus or minus 2 pi over a kx hat or plus or minus 2 pi over a ky hat. Uh, so to construct the Fermi surface in the reduced zone scheme, we need to translate all pieces of the Fermi sphere into the first brilliant zone through reciprocal lattice vectors. So we need to look at uh, the occupied levels uh, uh, and basically see how much of the first brilliant zone, uh, second brilliant zone, third brilliant zone, etc. are occupied and we need to translate them into the first brilliant zone using reciprocal lattice vectors in our reduced zone scheme. So uh, here are the brilliant zones. Uh, so we have 2 pi over a um, and 2 pi over a, so a is our lattice constant in the, the reciprocal lattice of the square lattice, two-dimensional square lattice. The first brilliant zone is basically the square. Those are perpendicular bisectors of g1 vector. You can see that this uh, extends from minus pi over a to plus pi over a in both in x and y uh, directions. That's the first brilliant zone. The second brilliant zone is found by the area enclosed uh, using the perpendicular bisectors of G2. And that's basically going to be this uh, uh, other square, which will extend from um, um, minus 2 pi over a to plus uh, 2 pi over a along the diagonal. So you can see here. 
And the third brilliant zone is basically constructed by finding the perpendicular bisectors of uh, the vector G3. And that is basically going to be uh, another uh, square here, but you can see uh, we have missing pieces here because uh, all I have to do is to translate this uh, into the first brilliant zone using reciprocal lattice vectors. So I just need to consider the pieces that are uh, on top of the first brilliant zone or at, this, uh, at the sides of the first brilliant zone. So the first brilliant zone is the square, the red square that we have drawn here. It's the Wigner sites primitive cell in the reciprocal lattice. The second brilliant zone basically is uh, when reduced to the first brilliant zone, we basically fold the, the pieces of the second brilliant zone into the square and we will find that we have four pieces uh, that I have labeled two. So that's this green uh, square that's the second brilliant zone and for the third brilliant zone we fold uh, one two three four five six seven eight pieces into the first brilliant zone and we find uh, the this uh, blue square so these are the pieces of the brilliant zone okay so the first brilliant zone is the set of points in k space that can be reached from the origin without crossing a Bragg plane. So the first Bragg plane is at the first brilliant zone boundary, so we don't cross a Bragg plane. The second brilliant zone is the set of points that can be reached from the first zone by crossing only one Bragg plane. And if we generalize this to the n plus one brilliant zone, it's the set of points that can be reached from the nth brilliant zone by crossing only one Bragg plane. So this is how we reduce these brilliant zones into the first brilliant zone. So we just fold pieces of it into the first brilliant zone until the full uh, area is covered by the pieces of the uh, other zones. Now for free electrons, um, we have the energy dispersion relation e is equal to h bar square k square over 2m. Remember, so energy is proportional to k square. And this is parabolic. And you can see here, uh, when I reach the first brilliant zone uh, boundary, uh, if I continue to the second brilliant zone, I can just fold it back to the first brilliant zone using reciprocal lattice factors. And that's exactly what we do here. We bring these pieces of the uh, parabola uh, back into the first brilliant zone using reciprocal lattice vectors. So you can see that this piece is basically translated uh, to the first brilliant zone using reciprocal lattice vectors. So the Fermi level is in the first brilliant zone. So the Fermi sphere can be shown in the first brilliant zone. So if we have uh, the Fermi level in the first brilliant zone, then we will have uh, basically only the first brilliant zone shown, shown here. And this is the Fermi sphere. And uh, if this will be the case if I have one electron per unit cell. So how many uh, states do I have uh, available for these uh, electrons? So um, I have capital N uh, number of um, atoms, let's say. So this is going to be the number of uh, K levels I can fill. But since I have only one electron, uh, per unit cell, uh, I'm going to be basically uh, occupying uh, half of these uh, states because for for each k value, I can have uh, an up uh, up electron, up spin electron, or a down spin electron. So I will show it as half of this is empty and half of it is full. For more than two electrons per primitive cell, the Fermi sphere will expand and cover more than two bands. So uh, if I have uh, exactly two electrons per primitive cell, then all of these uh, uh, levels would be filled uh, because I can put um, two electrons uh, per uh, the k value, uh, up spin and down spin, there's the spin degeneracy. So if I have more than that, so you can see that this Fermi sphere will extend uh, beyond the first brilliant zone. So which means uh, all the 
uh, quantum states in the first brilliant zone will be filled. So I will show this as a completely uh, filled first brilliant zone. And for the piece of the Fermi sphere that is extending to the second brilliant zone here, you can see that I have to fold those pieces uh, back into the first brilliant zone. So when those pieces are folded, uh, so you can see that this will be folded inside, this will be folded inside, this will be folded inside, this will be folded inside. Uh, I will see that basically the second brilliant zone is, is this green one when reduced to the first brilliant zone. And the empty space stands for the states that are not filled by electrons and uh, the, the areas that I have uh, filled are basically occupied by the free electrons in the Fermi sphere. Uh, now another example, if the Fermi surface extends into three pan bands, what would happen? Uh, so if I have a lot more electrons, uh, then uh, for each piece I have to uh, fold it to the first brilliant zone. So first brilliant zone is completely full. The second brilliant zone I have to fold those pieces uh, into the uh, first brilliant zone. So this would be uh, folded uh, like this, for example. Um, so this would be folded like this, and then I would have uh, this part of the uh, uh, Fermi sphere that's going to appear in the first brilliant zone, etc. So this is basically the procedure I have to follow. So when I do that, you see these uh, parts of these triangles are folded inside and then there is this arc uh, of the arc uh, of the Fermi surface that is inside the second brilliant zone. So those are here and there are empty spaces here. So not all the states in the second brilliant zone are uh, filled. So that means I will have some empty space here. And for the third brilliant zone part, I do exactly the same. I fold those pieces that are inside the Fermi surface into the first brilliant zone. And this is basically what I will obtain. So um, this is the procedure with which I construct Fermi surfaces uh, for the square lattice. Of course, it's going to be a lot more complicated for three-dimensional crystals. It will be difficult to imagine, but that is basically the idea uh, behind building these uh, Fermi surfaces. So in summary, we're looking at the maximum uh, energy level occupied by electrons. Uh, for block electrons, basically, we need to look at the the, the maximum uh, band that is partially filled and we look at the energy of the uh, maximum energy of the electron which we call the Fermi level, Fermi energy and uh, we look at the, uh, the surface that is uh, defined by this Fermi energy the, the e, e n of k is equal to ef is a constant energy surface that's what we call the Fermi surface now, obviously, for free electrons, this was the Fermi sphere. So this Fermi surface can be quite different for uh, black electrons. Now, the procedure for building a Fermi surface was basically going through the reciprocal lattice um, Wigner sites primitive cells uh, uh, to find first brilliant zone, second brilliant zone, third brilliant zone, etc. And we fold those brilliant zones into the first brilliant zone in the reduced zone scheme and we can find uh, the number of occupied levels in each brilliant zone or we can represent them in this reduced zone uh, scheme. And uh, for the free electron case, if we have one electron per unit cell, we have uh, basically the first brilliant zone is half uh, full, half empty. So we're going to see that we, we have the Fermi sphere inside the first brilliant zone. For more than two electrons per primitive cell, then we're going to have it extends to the second brilliant zone or possibly to, to the third brilliant zone and for each piece of the Fermi sphere that is out uh, that is in the second brilliant zone third brilliant zone etc we fold it back over to the first brilliant zone and we can basically uh, represent the number of states occupied by the electrons this way and this is uh, creating our uh, Fermi surface and uh, the most complicated case I considered was uh, the situation when I have 
uh, a lot of electrons per primitive cell so that the third brilliant zone uh, is also uh, taken into account and for each piece of the brilliant zone that is inside the Fermi sphere I fold it back to the first brilliant zone in the reduced zone scheme and this is basically uh, telling me how these states are occupied by uh, free electrons.